Hello, and welcome to Building High Performance Cultures, a weekly series where we talk with executives from top organizations about how they've built high performance cultures and how they're leveraging their culture as competitive advantage. I'm Marty Parker, the President and Chief Executive Officer of Waterstone Human Capital, and my guest today is the founder and blue collar CEO of Freshco.ca, not the grocery store, Mandy Renahan. Mandy, welcome to Building High Performance Cultures. Hey, Marty. Just a little background, and then I'm going to ask you to fill in all the blanks. But uh, okay. by the age of 19, which is amazing, Mandy had founded Freshco.ca, not the grocery store, Canada's number one full service reconstruction and retail manufacturing provider operating across Canada and the Eastern United States. But her vision goes well beyond successful business. She is redefining the color blue to help solve the massive skill trade shortage in North America and to bring respect to where it should be to the blue collar workers. So Freshco.ca, not the grocery store, and Mandy have received countless business awards. We're not gonna go through them all. That'd be the show in itself. That'd be another show. Yeah. But she's also a Canada's most admired CEO winner, which she received in 2018. So Mandy, let's start with this. For those who aren't familiar, maybe with you, and if they haven't, they should be and will be, our watchers and, and listeners, or with Freshco.ca, not the grocery store, tell us a bit about the business, about you, and the culture you've built there. So it's funny, you know, because there's always been a little bit of, uh, let's just say, um, fun talk about the Freshco reality. And just so you know, I started this, this company when I was, uh, really 18 going on 19 out of Halifax, Nova Scotia and Freshco. So you can imagine I was here first with the name. What's ironic is, is that uh, Sobeys was one of my clients way back then. And, you know, basically I was always interested in construction. I left home with a dirty hockey bag, basically full of everything I had out of Yarmouth, worked on dairy firms, horse firms out of the 4-H program. You know, and, and I basically said, hey, for whatever reason, I want to be in construction. I don't know why. And whatever money I have, I'm going to send back to my parents. And so I started calling people at night on my maybe half a day off a week and said, listen, if, um, if, if, you'll, if you'll hire me, I'll work for free, um, you know, to gain this experience. And they'd hang the telephone up on me, Murray. So I'd call them back. And I would say, and, and, I, and I just said, I said, listen, you're going to like me you're going to like me and I'm a quick learner. And they were like, well, how the hell do we say no to that? <laughs> and so, so it just started from there. I started learning all about the business and, and, and I had a couple uh, residential projects that went really right for some influential people. And, and, and really what happened after that was I saw a big void in the retail uh, maintenance and construction industry. And so I was the first person, I guess, to come up with the, the, the one call 24 seven, uh, maintenance regime for retailers across the board and we went all through Canada now we're down through the northeastern United States and it basically offered them you know where they would have multiple verticals and multiple facilitators and multiple vendors um, we made their life very easy and set up basically a, a platform of a, of a modality that didn't exist so that was when I was 19 20 and uh, you know it just my big break came when I was 24 and they're like, listen, Mandy, you know what? We want you to come to San Francisco. Well, you know, Marty, I hadn't had a garden salad until I was 21. I mean, I grew up on chicken and potato salad in Yarmouth, right? So it was just a dream and, 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 and walking into a boardroom, 24 years old, you know, here I was a female in this industry on top of it. I was gay. What a resume. And, and you know, and here I am flying to freaking San Francisco with my Newfoundland, Newfoundland friend that I played hockey with because she said I needed an assistant. And, you know, walking into this boardroom that was, you know, uh, 150 feet long and uh, with four, four guys from corporate America sitting there staring at me and and they say, wow, you know, Mandy, we've heard some great things about you. And at that moment, I think when we're talking about culture, uh, Marty, it's, 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 really, it's, it's really important that, that anybody listening to this today knows that I've never changed. And even at that moment, I laugh when I'm interviewed because people say, Mandy, does it ever cross your mind to be a little bit more corporate, ever? And, and, and at that moment, I've got like probably the biggest deal of, of, of my young life happening in San Francisco in front of these four guys. And, and, and I'm from Canada, so 
you know what that means. <laughs> <laughs> I do. So, so, so that was back then, uh, to, uh, to 20 years ago. And, and, and right at that moment, I remember looking at them and saying, you know what? You're darn right I must be special because I said, who flies a freaking Canadian lesbian across the country and read men's pants? I said, if you're not amazing. And, and I mean, they looked at each other, Marty, and their faces turned red. And then they just howled and they were like, this is going to be awesome. So that seven minutes that I was supposed to have, you know, in that room turned into an hour. And um, yeah, about an hour and a half later, I walked out of there with a contract of almost $5 million uh, at 24 years old. Mm -hmm. And so then it just, it just went from there. And, and I think that, you know, when you look at, I, I never went into the industry, Marty, because it was a sexy industry. I went into it because I had an interest in building and maintenance is just really just a smaller element of construction. Mm -hmm. There was a void there and, and, and I seized the opportunity and the reality is, is that I, you know, they're, uh, they're writing a book on me right now called the Blue Collar CEO. And I remember after being in a couple of meetings about three or four months ago with different people that were asking for my advice, I remember calling my ghostwriter and saying, okay, I've got a new chapter. And she goes, well, what's that going to be, Bear? And I said, corporate constipation. That's <laughs> going to be the chapter. And, in, and she looked and she goes, Oh, she said, you just made my whole day. And I said, it's amazing to me how people think that you can take a, a human being that's a certain way with their, their friends, their family, when they're out to a pub, when they're in social, and then you bring them into an office building and, and really Marty, they come, you don't even know who they are. They change. And when I ask them, why are they like that? At first they think it's a trick question. And then the second, they really truly don't know how to answer because they're, they're filled with fear because they believe that this is the way they're supposed to be. And this is what success looks like. Right. And, and so when I was building Freshco, I didn't listen, Marty, when you talk about culture, I was diverse before it was even an idea. Right. I was, I was inclusive before it was a stroke of genius. You know, and it was organically done because I was picking people that really, truly had the personality, the ambition to want to learn. I mean, up until today, all of my people are self-taught in my business. And the reality was, is that more so than anything, they believed in the leader and they knew that I would give them the skills necessary for them to be successful. And I think that it's so important, Marty we hear the word culture tossed around all the time. Mm -hmm. And to be quite honest, sometimes it's just so incredibly bullshitty that, 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 that let's be honest. I mean, it's, it's, it's a tokenism, a form of tokenism. And, and the reality is, is that people today, especially the young people, they're going to call you out on that. Yeah, they're going to yeah. call you out on it and, and, and thank God that they are. Because at the end of the day, there's a transparency. And, and, and people say to me all the time, Marty, you know, they'll say, Mandy, I meant to say Mandy, but I said Marty. See, buddy, I need, I need an app. <laughs> That's okay. Yeah. And, 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 and listen, the, the, you know, they'll, they'll say, you know what, Mandy, I, I want to be authentic. And I'm like, do you even know what that word means? Because that's the other word. There's culture and there's, and, and there's authentic. Mm -hmm. and, and, and really, the, the two of them go completely hand in hand, even though they're using two completely different scenarios and conversations. And, and people will come to me and say, but Mandy, I'm different. And I'm like, wow, perfect. Let's have a talk. And they're like, but, but if I don't fit into a corporate culture, they, they told me I, I, I basically didn't fit in. And I said, but you didn't fit in. You didn't. Because they're asking you to be a completely different person than you are, which does not, um, what I would say, kickstart creativity and really is the, the antidote to perseverance and performance. Mm -hmm. and, and so, so, so that's where I think when we, when we look at it all, when you look at where I came from now, also I grew up in Nova Scotia, Marty, and you know that that comes with its whole other list of conveniences in being authentic. You know, like we didn't grow up with money. You know, we, 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 you know, if somebody, something happened to somebody, you took every dime you had 
and you you went out and it baked something and 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 traveled a mile in in the snow to get it to them because it was the it was the thing to do because mm -hmm. it was real and i think that what's happened marty is is that i was able to bring my east coast upbringing up into what i would call corporate north america and i never knew how to be different like when people say, Mandy, are you like this every day? I'm like, listen, people, I'm like this every freaking day. I wake up like this. You know, I, I don't know how to be different. And I think that the, a lot of times they've called me respectfully uncensored. And it's because I am respectful. It's not e even in my DNA to be disrespectful. But I'm going to tell you what you probably don't want to hear. But the fact is, Marty, they do want to hear it. They do. People do. Yeah. And so. Mandy, tell us a little bit about. Track? No, you're on, it's, this is such an important conversation yeah. because it's about being real. And, you know, as you said, maybe, you know, I'm going to turn it around a little bit, but maybe being a little less corporate and a lot more real is what we need. Yeah. Right. Uh, in, in the world. Now, where did this come from? Yes, I know you're from Yarmouth, Nova Scotia, yeah. but I've heard you refer to your parents. I've heard you refer, refer to your friends. I mean, where, where, what are the early origins of the behaviors that drive the culture that is, that is bare? Well, I, 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 listen, I, I can only tell you that, I mean, when I watch my mom and dad now, I mean, you know, I am the best of both of them. I have a twin brother and God love him. He, he got the worst of both of them. And we have a little chuckle about that. But, <laughs> you know, when you, when you look at all the different ele elements of me, uh, you know, I've always had the personality from day one. I mean, this was nothing, you know, one of the best compliments you get in your whole life, Marty, is when, you know what, you, you, you breach the 40 mark, you've been in business for over 20 years and you see somebody that you knew growing up, you know, growing up and they're like, you know, Bud Renahan, you haven't changed a bit. <laughs> and it's really because I, I don't need, I, I didn't find a need to change. I was getting uh, so, so many things in my life were, and it doesn't mean that there weren't hardships attached to that, Marty, because there right. were a ton of them. And I think that I tell people, I'm like, listen, if you're going to bring somebody in your business or somebody in your bed, they better have a lot of scars. Those are the people that got the resilience. They got the personality. <laughs> you know, I, I, I say, when you're looking at a centerfold that I said, it's got no scars, there's nothing there. And it's the same thing with business. And I, I you know, and I think that, Marty, a lot of times we're going after what we think to be that perfect person, right? But they've spent so much time trying to look and be perfect that, that you've missed the fact that this person is such a, a, a misfit outside of that corporate reality that, that they're willing to actually, they just want to be their own and, and you'll get everything out of them because you've allowed them to be them. And so, so being, you know, growing up in Yarmouth and I was, you know, one of the athletic people growing up, I had a very wide range of, 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 of stamina and, and, and different types of ways to be disciplined from a very young age. So I had ambition, I had that knowledge of strategy, all of it, you know, and people are looking and go, yeah, but Mandy, you grew up in Yarmouth. And I'm like, yeah, but you know what? Not everything's a textbook. You know, we, and I was part of the 4-H program, Marty, which I'm a massive, massive yeah. uh, advocate for because I call it the MBA of young people. You know, I think that anybody that's in Canada, anybody that's coming to Canada, you put them in that program for a couple years, Marty, and you've got some winners coming out. They're not like big ones Agreed. because it really shows them real different types of tactical type skills that we're missing today in society that's not on an iPad, that's not on whatever. You try to train a freaking calf that just came out a week ago oh. to walk in a ring and you just see how much personality you grow in a year. Eh? Good so, luck to you on that one. Yeah. So, so I think that when you, when you look at all of it, Marty, I think it's the reality is, is that those hardships and, and we are living, Marty, in a, in a time where we're obsessed with perfection instantly. Right. And I want to say that again. We're obsessed with perfection instantly. And, it, and it's everything from getting that best job, getting that best office, getting that raise, getting the bonus, having the perfect house, being able to say, hey, I've traveled all over Europe by the time I was 28. We are, we are, uh, we are outcome obsessed right now, Marty. And what happens with that is, we lose all the potholes we sink in. We lose all the wrestling matches in the backyard after a six pack. We lose all of the things that make us human. We, we really have lost all those things and those modalities that make us into a real human being. So, so that when I'm sitting in front of you, Marty, I'm able to look and say, 
you're like, yeah, maybe, you know what? I, 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 I just overspent the market went bad and I, I had to go bankrupt. And when somebody tells me that I look and I go, and how are you now? And they're like, it's the best thing that ever happened to me. But we're so afraid to admit that we've made mistakes. And that vulnerability is really too what's missing, uh, Marty, out of these conversations that we're having with people. And I think that that's, that when you look at culture, it can't be based about a modality. It's got to be based upon many, many different types of personalities filling one room and knowing what that feels like. It, I mean, let's be honest. I mean, it's an absolute shit show, but it's, ama it's an amazing one, right? And, and, and that's where leadership comes in. When you hear the word leadership, I mean, that's thrown around all the time too. And it's like, what is a leader? Well, a leader is somebody who absolutely understands um, that she or he is the cloth that cleans the fogginess off of people's glasses. That's really what you are. You're that cloth. You know, because they can't see, because they're blinded by this obsession to be better now. Confidence happens in stages. I mean, even me, Marty, I mean, I look at me and I look and I say, I, I can't wait for my next, you know, two or three, four or five, 10, 20 years, God willing, how long they're going to give me. It happens in stages. And that's what happens when you look at, when I look at different people in their 20s, taking over management or leadership roles. And I'm like, you're going to fail. And, and they look at me and they go, but Mandy, that's not a very nice thing to say. And I said, I don't really care if you think it's nice. The reality is, is that that human being doesn't have enough life experience right now for you to put them in that particular um, environment. Yeah. And I think that that's what happens, Marty, is that they want it so bad and you want to give it to them because they're convincing, but we're, we're missing the metrics behind the fact that there's no way that somebody that's 24, 25, coming out of school has any idea how to motivate people and develop them. And so that's the idea is that we're, I'm not saying that we're looking for old people, uh, Marty. I'm not saying that. <laughs> I, I'm merely saying that success in a culture comes from the different types of personalities, modalities, and, and also different criteria and variables of where they're at in their lives, which is why I've often loved combining men and women. And I love combining older people with maturity, different phases of maturity and different aspects, you know, and, and when you look at, you know, a lot of people say, you know what, uh, you know, I, I hired a consultant. Well, why did you hire a consultant? What is a consultant, Marty? Well, I'll tell you what most of them are. Most, most of them are people that have, an, you know, an inordinate amount of, of history dealing with different people, environments, companies. So, so, so really more so than anything, you're just dealing with somebody who's had their head kicked in about a hundred times and come back a hundred times after that. I That's have the scars to prove it here. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so, so, so I think that it's, it's one of those things is we're not saying that, you know, and it, it's, it's like trying for us to, to, to really set an expectation bar that's relative to younger people, but also the older generation to look and say, where are we setting the bar for them? Because I'm not a fan of ageism, Marty, never have been. Right. When you look on TV, some of the most popular people out there have been on TV for 40 or 50 years because they don't care. <laughs> they're sure real, they're them. And so, you know, they're not out there acting like the younger generation who's trying to to get that same buy-in as, as, as people that have been there. So I think that for me, if I was to give probably one of my best advice tips for everybody is to enjoy the ride. And I say this to leaders, it's like, let them enjoy the ride of failure. Let them enjoy the ride of feeling uncomfortable. Let them enjoy the ride, which they're not going to enjoy it. But the, the understanding that resilience comes from being uncomfortable. And that's the one thing I've recognized in most companies and cultures, more so than anything right now, Marty, is that people are so frightened of confrontation that they don't realize that it is a necessary evil to bring them to that next stage of confidence and that things are not personal. And if they do get personal, take it outside. Don't keep it inside the office. It's true. And, you know? Do. And you know, as you talk about so well, failure is critical because it leads to experience. And mm -hmm. the more experience we have, 
which comes from failure, the more likelihood we're going to stumble upon a success along the way. Right? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And, and I think there is, I, whether it be the internet, society, the things we see in so many people being successful, uh, without blemishes, as you say, without the scars, it, it has led to you thinking, I need to be successful fast. Not to mention the fact that they're seeing some young people, and we always do through every generation, successful fast, and that's fine. But they're, they are the exceptions, not the norm. And they still didn't come with experiences. They were right time, right place, right concept. Yep. And some of them really bloody smart, too. Yeah, absolutely. And so I think those experiences are important. And I think this actually is an opportunity what we're going through, not just to reinvent, re-envision, but for us to realize that grit and resilience drive success. Yeah, it does. It really does. And I think that, you know, we, we've been in a society right now that has, and, and, and I want to be very clear, when I hear the word entitled, entitlement has no age on it right now, Marty. No, I see entitlement from the age 20 right now up to 75. Right. And then after 75, they just don't give a shit. So it's... <laughs> <laughs> just like, I don't care if you believe me or not, but I think that the point is, is that that's what I've seen happen here is that there's been an entitlement that's been deflated yes. and a real, uh, you know, a, a real wake up call to the fact that, you know what, you can't shut down full economies and think that, you know what, it's like I, I, I told my people when this happened, because we were no different than anyone else. We got smoked. I mean, all of our clients are retail. They were right. all shut down. We were shut down. And, and what happened was, is that for me, it was making them understand that when something happens like this, that is so bizarre outside of anything you've ever seen, I can't open up a textbook. I can't Google Marty right now. What do you do as a business owner when a virus shuts down the economy for three months? What, what do you do? And I think that that's the idea is that people, I've, reckon, I've recognized how judgmental a lot of people have been through this to different business leaders and different people. And, and I, and I caution them, you know, it's funny. I looked at my CFO and I said, you know, I would love to come up with this little interaction. You know what, Marty, maybe this is an idea it is to really reenact what it's like to be a sole shareholder or to be a small business or a medium business that literally you were in great shape before the world shut down. And then you had to lay people off quickly in order to preserve capital. And, you know, you're trying not to hurt people's feelings. You're trying to help everybody. It's almost like you would like to do a reenactment, almost like a, some form of a, of a virtual monopoly to let, the, pe let them put them in your shoes Tough, eh? for a couple days to see what would they have done. And I think that that's the question when you look at, at, at something so ambiguous to what's happened right now, Marty, is what would have they done? And, and I mean, for me, I, I actually look at feedback as a pain in the ass and a waste of time. I'm like candor all the way. Just give her respectfully and just ask it. You know, and I think that that's the other thing that we're missing in a cultural environment is making people understand that there's been so many times, Marty, that if people have come to me with something and it's valid, but the way that they've projected it, I could feel the back of the hairs on my neck coming up and I'm like, they have no idea how to project a concern or an idea to somebody who's a decision maker that will work in their favor, the business's favor. And so this is one thing that I always talk about when I talk about personality and vulnerability. There's a lot of smart people out there, Marty, but are they likable? It's true. Right? And you find out in crisis, don't you? <laughs> you know, it's just amazing how... Uh, you are able to see who are the people out there really, truly that believed in you, believed in the brand, believed. And, and, and at the end of the day, Marty, when, when stuff like when we go through stuff like this, the saddest part is, is that there's casualties and there's going to be everywhere. Yep. And then there's part of those casualties, really, truly, that you look at and say, was I operating at my best? Did I have the best team? You know, you know, where was our cultural aligned as well? Because, you know, Marty, when th times are good, everybody gets busy in all these other different directions and they do take their eye off the ball. Sometimes we do we uh, as business owners. And I think that that's the idea. And, and my biggest, my biggest word of this whole conversation behind culture is impact. You know, how much impact 
did my culture or me have on um, the people that worked with me, the people that worked for me, my vendors. I mean, you even look at right now, I mean, the biggest thing that I'm hearing that's heartbreaking for me, Marty, other than what happened to all my Nova Scotians, was there's trade people out there were still in a systemic time of a trade shortage and a lot of them aren't being paid. You know, you look at me, I had to haul out all of my, my, my luxury washroom trailers to, to put on the side of the main artery of the highway so that the people that actually were feeding our very hierarchy asses at home, food, drugs, alcohol, whatever else you want, yeah. they weren't even being up, given the chance to not only have something to eat, but the dignity to be able to go to a regular washroom and wash their hands. And it goes back to my whole thing, Marty, as I look at it, I'm like, listen, people, this is not okay anymore. You know, and I said, more so than anything, from a business perspective, this is a, this is a movement, Mandy, perspective. But from a business perspective, I look and I'm like, my God, you guys are stupid. And they look at me and say, Mandy, well, that's not very nice. And I'm like, listen, at the end of the day, you can't fix stupid, but we can help dumb. And the reality <laughs> is that I look at them and I say, these people are not only professionals in their field, Marty, but they're consumers at the end of the day. And they will remember the people that shut them out when they were putting themselves in harm's way. They'll remember. And, and that's another thing about culture that people don't understand is that people remember, they do remember how you treated them, how you spoke to them. Were you really engaged on an authentic real level with them or was it a corporate modality that they were expected to say or do yeah true enough manny when you're looking for people for your organization right or you're assessing mm -hmm. how do you know when they fit or maybe when they don't i mean there's this incredible authenticity i've been there i've been in the organization i've been offered water five times before i've sat down I had a conversation with your brother one day. I'll never forget. Yeah. Uh, right. Yeah. And, and I mean, these are the things you don't, you just don't forget them. Yeah. Yeah. But when you're looking to bring those people in, what, what is that? What are you looking for? How do you know you got the right person? You, you know, it's so funny because people really complicate everything, Marty. It's the same thing I look for when I was looking for the love of my life. Mm -hmm. It's a feeling. Mm -hmm. You know, you're, you're looking for that feeling and there's an energy as soon as they walk in, they open up their mouth, they, 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 they reach their hand, how they shake your hand, True. how they look into your eyes or they look away from you, not saying that any of these things are the concrete answer, but it's like, it's like warming somebody up to, do I want to give you more time? Do I want to give you more of my time? Actually, it kind of feels like I might. So then it's like the phases of confidence. It's the same thing. You move them in. And that's what I teach my people. It's like, how does somebody make you feel when they walk into the room? Do they make you want to approach them? Do they have impact? And it doesn't have to be Mandy impact, Marty. We don't need any more Mandys in the bed. You know, we don't need any more Marty's over at the, at the beer station. We need, you know, a Cynthia and a, and a Ryan and a whoever that are critical thinkers they're, they're a little bit, you know, they're a little bit more introverted, but they're funny as hell and they're amazing people. And I think that that's when you look at the, the differential behind diversity. It's not even a lot of times about our sexual orientation. It's not about our skin color. It's True. about personality. And these are the different things that I try to say to people day in and day out. The biggest compliments I always get, Marty, is hey, like, Mandy, you know, like, I, Mandy, the people are just awesome. And it's not because they don't make mistakes, Marty. Because we know they do. Yep. It's the fact that they make them gracefully and on a real spectrum. And, and people, it, listen, if you lie to me, I don't know what I'm going to do because then I'm going to end up going there and shoot my mouth off because I don't know the truth. If you tell me the truth, then I'm able to fix it quickly. And that's why I, that's why I say to you is that when you look today at our, like literally at our cultures right now, a lot of them are really have been curated by a person or people that wouldn't know what authentic and real was if it crawled up their arse. Seriously. So yeah. then, then you're asking other people to buy into something that's basically a module that nobody follows. 
And if they do follow, it might not be the right thing. So I think that there really truly has to be something that is so authentic and real about your organization or you will die. It's just that simple because people today, Marty, are, they're sick of it. I mean, I get away with more than anyone else in the world up on a stage. <laughs> it's because I really truly don't know any other way to be. And my, my mandate is always to make people feel amazing about themselves, whether it hurts them or not. It's no different than I said to my dad the other day. He said, it looks like your brother's putting on some weight. And I said, did you tell him that, Pop? He goes, well, I did, but I was joking. I'm like, but you, you were joking. And I said, and second of all, nobody needs to tell somebody that they're getting chubby. They know they're chubby, right? So, so the idea is, is that I think that we've, we've almost templated things to the point, Marty, that people have lost interest, right? And if we would just stop complicating what a culture really is, then we would see a lot more companies out there be leveraging their power on a greater level of philanthropy while they grow than really just hitting these token, because the, the word success means nothing to me, uh, Murdy, never has. I'll tell you the word that should always replace success, Murdy, in any environment, business relationship and it's the word consistency the, the the leaders in the world and the people in the world that remain consistent through thick and thin are the ones that you want sitting at your kitchen table and at your boardroom table 100%. day in day out yeah i think a lot of people have kind of seen that in certain leaders these days and and not in others right and yep. and there's, you hear a lot about Andrew Cuomo. Well, every day he's dealing with people dying in the city that he's been born and raised and, and now helps lead and, and yeah. serves others. That's tough. But, right? but why do people, love, why are they loving him? They're loving him because he tells he's the truth. Real. And he tells yeah. the truth, you know, and he admits when he's wrong and he doesn't, you know what? He's not expecting, you know what? A, you know, a circular motion for a half an hour on his back when he does something great. You know, it's like, he, it's like I said about being chubby. He knows he's done something right. And that's his motivation to keep going. Yeah. And, I, yeah, and I think 100%. that, you know, that ability for people to need to be, oh, you know, I, I think that there's such a, a, a world of opportunity, Marty, right now in really exposing what development looks, in hum, looks like in human beings. But we have had to tell people how amazing they are too long, yeah. too many times a day, and, and making them understand that when I tell you that, Murdy, you're gonna thank me, we're gonna move on, and, but is that gonna be something that's gonna stay with you? No, it's gonna be the motivation of how amazing you are and the progress you're making and the performance you have is gonna show in your confidence, in your paycheck, in how people view you when you walk in a room because they'll be able to feel it. And there's a, there's a really thin line. I've always said right now, they're like, you know, Mandy, I'm not sure if you are one of the most confident goddamn people I've ever met in my life, or you're just goddamn arrogant. <laughs> and I said, well, if you were to look up in, in, in you know, in, in, in the thesaurus, what they both mean, I can tell you that I am the absolute antithesis to arrogance because people really, Marty, don't understand when they're in the presence of somebody that's crazy confident today, that's real, they're afraid of them, but they're crazy attracted to them too, yeah, right? hundred percent. So I think that that's the whole, you know, the, the idealism behind being real. I mean, when you look it up in the East Coast Dictionary, it says, you know what? The real McCoy. You know what? The fresh cod. Like, that's what it is, being it is. authentic. And, and, and with that, it's, it's probably one of my biggest uh, pieces of advice that I give more so to parents and leaders is I'm like, stop trying to freaking make somebody into something they're not and form a culture that is fluid around people that accepts, accepts them and truly gives them the, the benefit of being extraordinary. You know, and stop, let's spending all these millions of dollars on culture slides and all this stuff that really at the end of the day, who watches Murdy? Who, right? I mean, Instagram has shown the human race 
that you and me both, we have 10 seconds. 10 right. seconds for you to grab our attention on an article, on a picture, on a whatever. So when you're putting together this 50 deck culture deck, who is watching after the third one? Just you. Exactly. Just yep. you. <laughs> you know, it's interesting. There's a lot of discussion right now, Mandy, on, on curating culture. But if culture is us, is about our organization, the authenticity of who it is, where the time needs to be spent is curating around the real, right? Yep. Focusing on, on supporting and developing more about who you really are. Yep. As opposed to less or as opposed to something that you think you should be. So, I mean, that's pretty interesting stuff. That, that's basically be more of who you are and less of who you think you should be. Well, yeah. I mean, listen, the time and the energy that people put into that, listen, there'd be, there'd be less anxiety. There'd be, there'd, be, there'd be less necessity for probably marijuana. There, there would be so <laughs> many other different, you know, now alcohol, you know, I'm a little bit biased. <laughs> But, you know, I, I think that, you know, when you look at the energy that it takes people to try to feel like they need to be somewhere else, and I think that that's the other thing this pandemic has done, is it's really shown because of IT and technology, you know, people are able to work from home a lot of the time, and they're balanced there because they're not in an environment that they feel like they need to be different. Isn't that funny? It's, it's amazing. And so this is where even for me as is, 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 is an owner of a company, I looked back and I went, we don't need offices anymore. We need a space that we can all congregate in. <laughs> we can eat the best food from whatever restaurant we're going to support that week. And we have meetings and we have training and we just have a place for all of us to feel each other's energy, fill each other's you know, gas tanks back up. And then you move back to your balanced life at home where normally you wouldn't run in the morning. You wouldn't go to the gym. But now because you're balanced, I mean, when you look at the time people were spending in traffic, Marty, I, I think I want to be clear. There's working at home with a culture that is going to feed your energy levels over here and vice versa. And I think that when people say, oh, you know, I work from home, I'm like, do you just work from home? And they're like, yeah. And I'm like, that's not good. It's I not agree. good because we truly don't have enough. We don't, our tanks aren't big enough to refuel ourselves. I mean, that is gonna come from other people and understanding where your business is going. And like I said, I go back to that training reality and, and also the meeting reality is, I don't, I wanna have little rooms that people could have small meetings in. You know, maybe they have, you know, something that they need to discuss that's not everybody else's concern. And I think more so than anything, Marty, that's what this pandemic has done is it's opened up a lot of opportunities into the health of your employees. And, 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 and the reality of is how many people now will look and say, hey, I only need two or three great pairs of jeans and suits right now. I don't need eight, right? Mm -hmm. I, I, don't, I don't need, you know, I might buy a bigger car because I'm only driving it once or twice a week rather than having a smaller car I never felt safe in. But because it was uh, more economical, I had to buy that car. So, mm -hmm. so it's really about decisions, Mary. It's, it's really looking at this isn't just help business people look at what they can do or do without. It's, it's helped us look at, instead of us asking people to bring their lunch in every day, Marty, I'm looking and saying, like, let's all of us throw a toonie. If you guys all throw, throw a toonie into our, into our feast pig, then basically I'm going to throw 200 in. And we're going to go around to all of the amazing entrepreneurs and small businesses in our area. It's and we're going we're gonna to feed them, like, because they've been hit. Yeah. Right. And I, and I really just think it's, it's just about, you know, it, it's, 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 it's about cr creativity right now. It really is. And listen, I, I, you've hit on virtually all of, I was talking in the last couple of weeks doing another thing this week on the future of workplace culture yeah. and a huge, I'm saying wellness is a huge part of it. I'm saying that the workplace becomes the face to face place and the meeting place. Hey, there are those of us who want to go and work in the office and you do need your tank filled, fill your boots. But yep. it doesn't have to be that way anymore. And I think for many of us, that has changed, me included. And I consult yep. on this stuff, uh, Mandy. So what does that tell you? But it does become a place that is maybe we, we require and we need, but maybe just a little bit differently, right? Yep. It, it yep. becomes the community center of our work lives. It does. It does. And you know what? There's nothing wrong with that. No. I mean, really, it's like, you know what? You have a party once a week and 
you know what? And then you move back to your normal life. And I think that that's something that now this has given people permission to, to, to be more authentic in what, what, you know, what's more healthy for them and the company, you yeah. know, and, and, and overheads are going to shift for me. I don't think it's going to shift to the fact that I'm going to save money, Marty. It's going to shift on where I put that money. I agree. You know, and I think that that's where, you know, there's just going to be a lot more spaces for rent at a better price. And maybe that's just the way it needs to be for the next yeah, 10 years. It's, right? it's, it's possible. It's absolutely possible. I think you've obviously given this a lot of thought and you oh, and yeah. I tend to agree on this. Not everyone does, but let me ask you a couple of final questions. You've been over the top supportive as a mentor and a big believer in mentorship. Yep. And I know you personally serve as a mentor and you challenge others to do it too. Um, but, but you know, how do, how do people today who are listening or watching this, how do they find a mentor and what should they ask of their mentors? Well, I think, you know, you and I had a, a conversation before when you look at how I started my business, mm -hmm. I basically went out with the right intent of what I wanted. I wanted to gain experience in the trade industry and I had nothing really to offer them, but my physical being and the ability to help. And I think that what I've recognized in the mentorship world is that there is a, I don't want to call it um, an ignorance to time, but it's, it's this thing where it's gone from not enough people helping people to almost like you should help me because you're the one I picked. <laughs> and so, so, so it's one of those things that, so what's happened is, is that we've lost the ability to see that, that being mentored by someone that has been consistent in their life and in their business, you know, the world's always going to use the word success, Marty, is you have to realize that their time is so valuable for themselves, other outside of all of the different engagements and responsibilities they have. And it's so I look at mentorship as one of those things is that how are you going to catch my attention? How are you going to get my attention to show me that you are deserving of my time? Because mentorship is really consulting for free. Let's be honest. That's exactly what it is. <laughs> it is. So, so, so how many times, and I mean, I'll be the first one to say it and I'll probably end up saying it for everyone else, Marty. How many times I get people that are like, Mandy, have you got, you know, an hour for coffee, stop asking for coffee. Like, stop it. Like I, I tell people, stop asking me for coffee. I don't want another coffee and I, I don't want it with you because I don't even know you. You need to present to me why I, why I would want to give you some of my time and then we'll pick whether we're going to have a burrito, a coffee or an alcoholic beverage together as adults. Well, and I think that that's the one thing that I would like to see change, Marty. And I think that the more people really look at, and, I'm, and I, listen, for me, I look at, I'm like, I want to help everybody, but I can't. Right. I can't. And then, Marty, we all have helped people that it's gone nowhere. Zero. So, it's, so my advice for mentorship right now, and being somebody that helps people a lot, is that they have to look at the fact that this is almost like, the job that they want, but really it's the person they want. Mm -hmm. And so it's one of those things. It's like, what, how is your resume going to sell me on the fact that a, I'm going to give you my time. But secondly, once I do give you, give you my time, what is going to be that follow up that shows me that you didn't waste my time? You know, these are the two things that I look at today and I say, Marty, the biggest mentorship I got was get the hell outside and get the stink blown off you and hope that things happen. That was my mentorship. You wasn't know? bad either, was it? And it wasn't bad, you know, because I mean, like I said, I mean, I've had my teeth kicked in so many times, they've come back straighter and whiter every time, <laughs> you know? So, so, so a lot of my mem me mentorship, you know, and a lot of people that have come to me, Marty, they've come to me and I've taken one look at their energy, the way they were breathing, and I'm like, so tell me about your home life. And they're like, why I'm here to be mentorship about business. I said, but tell me about your home life. So as soon as they do, you realize very quickly that the issue that they have is actually not with it, their, their work life. Right. It's with their personal life that they're bringing to the work environment. So I have to fix this in them 
in order for me to be able to fix this, because we've compartmentalized our personal lives and our business lives, we've dissected them so far, Marty, that people are having a hard time figuring out who to be, when to be, and how to get there. So, 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 so mentorship for me is absolutely one of, you know what, it, 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 it's, it's the dynamite, you know, really, truly behind the explosion of the, the new world, hands down. But I just really need to tell people, if you're listening, if you read this, if you want results, if you want an hour of somebody's time who's consistent, who is a success, so, so to speak. Don't ask them for coffee. Don't. Don't ask them for coffee because all you're going to do is you're going to be one of a hundred people that have sent me a message asking me for coffee. You know, I want somebody who says, Mandy, you know what? I have a bike and I, I don't have money for the train, but I will bike to your office and I will wait for you between that time that you go to the bathroom or whatever, even if I could get 10 minutes of your time, this is what I need help on. I think the world of you. And if you say no, I I've tried my best. And let me ask you one final question, Andy. If you're giving advice mm -hmm. to a young entrepreneur, let's say a young, or could be a, a, young, a young professional manager, in terms of them saying to you, you've given them that mentorship time, you're giving them that, advice and they say, look, I'm, I'm just about to start kind of my high performance culture type journey. What's the one thing that you would advise me to ensure that I do? You know what? You, you, you really just keep your bullshit meter tucked yeah. away. <laughs> yeah. It really, really, uh, there's nothing more I can say is that if they've, if they've ha been given the time to be able to structure um, you know, what their life is going to look like going out into a more of a high performance, uh, you know, you know, type world is that today people are looking for someone who they trust and who they like. And if you can perform on top of that, it's over. It's over. And, and I'm going to say it one more time. Trust, likability, and performance is all you need. You know, the, the reality is, is that because being smart and creative and all the above, even whether you're brilliant, that all goes into performance. You know, we don't, we don't need to subsection this a hundred times. It's trust, likability, and because let's be honest, I mean, when you look at what happened in Nova Scotia, Murdy, at any time might be our number, might be our day, no matter how old we are, what that looks like. And people today like relationships, friendships, and businesses are going to pick the people that they trust, they like, and that can perform. Period. The end. Unless it's something that you are in a sub-minimal category of somebody that thinks categorically of how we're going to combine a meteor and an airplane together, you might not need that much personality. You might just need these certain skills. But for the general population, those are the three things that are really going to propel you in today's age. I can tell you that. And for God's sakes, be grateful. Yeah. What, what great advice to end on, Mandy. I mean, uh, being a, lot, a little less corporate and a lot more real, being authentic, you know, curating your culture around who you really are, keeping the bullshit man monitor down. And, and you know what? Make, I think you have made a living. And, and a life, more importantly, about making people feel good. Oh, listen, listen. When you look at what I do, like as, as, a, as, a, as services, uh, Marty, there's a lot of people that build beautiful buildings. There's a lot of people that renovate buildings. And you know what? Some of them probably do it better than me, but I can tell you what. Nobody does this like I do. No, Period I don't me. think there's a lot of people who just do life like you do. Yeah. And, uh, and we're Very real important. I take that as a compliment. <laughs> it is a compliment. Absolutely. And there's a lot that can be learned because this is an opportunity. You're fighting, you're, you're like that salmon fighting upstream. There's a lot less real today. Yeah, there's but you know lot. what? You get, you, get a, you get a great body out of it, great biceps, you're healthy, <laughs> your heart's pumping. I mean, you know, that's why I tell people, I'm like, through all of what you think is hard, look yep. at all the benefits because they're going to really come back and, 
And like I said, when you're in, in, in people stop making things difficult, stop trying to disconnect your personal world and your work world. They both need each other. So yeah. unless you're really Marty in a position where, um, you know, you get to a point in your life that you don't have to work, you don't want to work, you should never try to separate them completely. No, I believe it's work-life integration. It's not work-life yeah. balance. And it's different for all of us. It is. And it's, and it's going to be different coming out of this. And frankly, it might even be better once oh, we get through it all. Listen. Right? I mean, listen. Okay, buddy. There, you're great. awesome. Thank okay. you very much. Uh, there's a reason why you're a most admired CEO. But frankly, if we had a word for most admired person, you'd get that too. <laughs> Well, there you go. My... Next year, call me and let me know how it works out, Mark. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. And I Take will. Care, but love. listen, join us next week for another episode of Building High Performance Cultures. And in the meantime, if you want to learn more about this topic, go to waterstonehc.com and may your future be bigger than your past. Mm -hmm.